and welcome to this talk about design patterns, facts and misconceptions. So not everybody knows who I am, so allow me to quickly introduce myself. My name is Klaus, and I'm actually doing C++ trainings for a living. I know it does not sound like a very exciting job, but I kind of like it. It's interesting, you meet a lot of new people, although it's online nowadays, and also you see a lot of code, learn from code, discuss code, and I feel this is pretty interesting. It's not apparently enough C++ for me. I'm also writing C++ on our own. So I'm an author of the Blaze C++ Math Library. And I'm actually organizing a competing um, user group. Now, of course, it's a friendly user group, um, the one in Munich. Now, for tonight, I'm talking about software design and design patterns. And this is something that I've now started a while ago. I was arguing that there is not enough talks about software design. And this is, for instance, something I also mentioned in an interview, a CPP chat interview a couple of weeks ago. So both me and Tony Van Ert were invited by Phil Nash and John Kulp to talk about the solid principles. And this was actually a really fun discussion. And we exchanged a lot of experiences about software design. And at the end of this episode, I raised the question, why actually don't we talk about software design? Perhaps not anymore, perhaps we never have. And interestingly, both Tony and John confirmed my suspicion. Both of them say, because it's the hard thing, because there is no definitive answers. It's easy to talk about features to explain something that will always work. But to talk about soft design, that is really hard. There is no true answer. There's always answers like, it depends. And I believe this is why we don't talk about this. Although I feel this is really interesting and also really important. This is the fundamental things for our code. This is what helps us to maintain it for decades. So I believe we should talk more about it. And this is now exactly what I want to do tonight. So let's talk about software design and design patterns, which however is, as I said, the hard part. So right in the beginning to make it clear, the disclaimer, of course, as soon as we are talking about something where there's no definitive answers, there's a lot of subjective impressions and opinions. And I definitely will raise a couple of opinions on my own. And it's absolutely, absolutely okay if you have a different opinion. Actually, I feel this is just fine. This is what I would like to learn about because I believe then I might have missed something interesting. And so there is no definitive answers. It depends. But perhaps that is the reason why it's also fun and really interesting. And now I have actually quite, I have hours to talk about when we talk about design patterns. And I have definitely also hours to talk about misconceptions about design patterns and software design in general. Now I had to select a couple of things for a 60 minute talk. And so I selected something that I feel is simple enough, but also interesting enough to talk about. And so I start with an example, Stutmechanik. Simply because in the past couple of years, I've heard so many statements about Make Unique that I actually feel it's necessary to actually talk about this. So I've heard that Make Unique improves exception safety. Okay. I've heard that the Make Unique function fulfills the single responsibility principle. And I've also heard the statement that Make Unique is a factory function. Now, I want to talk about these statements before then, of course, digging a little deeper and also talk about other things. And the first statement is something that I believe you don't have to say a lot about, because indeed, this is absolutely true. Make Unique improves exception safety in the sense that it's like an atomic operation. You immediately create a unique pointer. The resource is immediately coupled to that. It's one operation only. Perfect. So this is definitely true. I don't really have to say a lot about this anymore. The second one, however, is by far more interesting. So the claim is that Make Unique, because it is like an atomic operation and improves exception safety, fulfills the single responsibility principle. Well, if you go to Wikipedia, read about the single responsibility principle, this is what it actually has to say. The single responsibility principle is a computer programming principle that states that every module, class, or function in a computer program should have responsibility over a single part of the program's functionality. And it should encapsulate that part. 
all of the module, class or function services should be nearly aligned with that responsibility. This is what a lot of people know. But interestingly, what people make out of that is that everything should do just one thing. This is, by the way, also why a lot of people criticize this principle, because it's so vague. It doesn't really have any meaning. It's like you understand it, but don't know what to do. The problem is, this is exactly not what it is talking about. Actually, it is talking about something different, which I basically summarized just as a hint in a, no, a pointer um, to talk at CPBCon. The single responsibility principle advises to separate concerns to isolate and simplify change. And that actually already has to do with software design. When we design software, we are actually interested in changing things easily or also extending things easily. That is the goal of software design, at least one of the important goals. And I know if you can again go to Wikipedia, look at software design, try to get impression what it does. It's kind of hard because this page sums up so many different aspects of software design. It's really tough to really understand what it's about. So I try now to simplify it. I give you my opinion on what software design is and hopefully kind of a simple statement. Software design is the art of managing interdependencies between software components. It aims at minimizing technical dependencies and introduces the necessary abstractions and possibly compromises. There's a couple of pretty important words in there from my point of view. It's an art. It's not a science. It's not something where you definitely always have an answer. It's the best you can do sometimes. Therefore, also compromises. Sometimes there is just not the possible solution. And you probably have to choose something that fits it best right now, where you might not know all about it. But most importantly, I believe that software design is the art of managing dependencies and abstractions. This is at the core of software design. This is what we actually want to do in order to be able to change things easily and extend things easily. Which now brings us back to make unique. So that's the std make unique function. And if you're not actually thinking about this in terms of software design, then you do find that it's not really abstracting anything. It has nothing to do with dependencies or either. Make unique will always give you a T, whatever this T is. And it will always allocate by means of new, always. So there's indeed no abstraction at all. Because there's no abstraction at all, it definitely has nothing to do with software design, nothing at all. And so it also has nothing to do with any kind of design principle that gives you advice to isolate concerns. There's nothing about this function that would help me to detangle entities in my software. So I definitely like, not, do not like the idea that this fulfills the single responsibility principle. It is just a function. However, perhaps to um, make the circle to design, let's consider the following. Let's say that, actually, because this is good advice, we use make unique throughout our code. So it's a large piece of code. We have, let's say, thousands of make unique calls scattered throughout the entire code. And we're actually pretty proud about this because, of course, it does a good job. But it probably encapsulates creating a T. But now imagine that you actually realize that new does not really give you everything you want. Your process is now running very, very long. You use make unique quite a lot of times, and you can actually measure that the fragmentation in your memory is growing. And at some point, there may be a crash because there might not be enough memory left. So you now decide that you don't want to use new anymore. You would like to use anything different. So there is actually frameworks like TBB that provide you some allocation scheme that works better in terms of fragmentation. How do you do that? How do you switch from new to any other kind of allocation? 
And you might realize this is actually a pretty tough job. Actually, software design is supposed to make things easy to change. But now that I've spread Make Unique all over my code, actually, it's kind of hard to change. I have to change all these places where I use Make Unique. So what about if you actually wrap it in a function like this one? Say create. Create takes some arguments, just like Make Unique, and internally does nothing but call Make Unique and return something. But it actually does not return a unit pointer visibly, obviously, it returns something. So now, if you use make uh, this, this create function, then you actually don't know really what you get. Uh, you'll probably just use an auto. You know it's a pointer, okay, uh, everything's fine, but you just get something. Now, if you decide that actually you don't want to use new anymore, you can change the code in one and exactly one place. You adapt create. You don't use make unique anymore, but you might now return a unique pointer that has a different deleter. And suddenly you've designed something. You've abstracted from new. You've created and inserted some kind of abstraction that allows you to change your code in one and exactly one place. So just to be sure or to be clear, it's not against make unique, but really it has nothing to do with soft design. It has nothing, it gives me not, not anything in terms of dependencies, managing dependencies and abstractions. All right, so I just don't think this is true at all. It has nothing to do with that. Which now brings us to the next statement. Make unique is a factory function. That one is actually a very difficult term, a very, very overloaded term that, for instance, is used in core guidelines. Now, I picked one, the C50. Use a factory function if you need virtual behavior during initialization. So just quickly to briefly to point out what the advice is. If you call a constructor, in that constructor, you should not call a virtual function. It might not do the right thing. The object is not properly initialized yet. So what you should do is you should write some kind of wrapper that first of all creates the object, potentially by make unique. Then you call a virtual init function, and then you return. So that call here, that is happening after the object is fully constructed. And this entire setup that you have a function, that is what the core guidelines call factory function. And well, the make unique is factory function just as well, right? Well, again, I'm using Wikipedia for help a little bit. So factory object oriented programming. That is the article that describes um, something about design patterns. True, there's a, a link to the factory method design pattern, but this is not generally the idea of a factory. Interestingly, they actually make a very, very clear distinction in this terminology um, uh, paragraph. So some sources refer to the concept as the factory pattern, while others consider the concept itself a programming idiom. The general concept of the factory is often confused with a specific factory method design pattern. So indeed, the term factory is something that we use for a lot of things. Sometimes we just mean it creates something. Sometimes we mean it actually wraps the construction of something. It's a heavily overloaded term indeed. Now, let's explain what actually is a design pattern and where in the, in the realm of software development this is uh, placed. So I would argue in the center is software design. Software design is managing dependencies between things, but usually the smaller things. So this is also something that we usually can change a little easier. And this is where design patterns come into play. Solutions, how we can detangle software entities by different way, in, in different ways, by means of different strategies. And of course, this is where a couple of well-known design patterns come in visitor, strategy, observer, all design patterns that you find in this pretty well-known book. 
1994 Design Patterns book, which we, because of the four authors, just refer to as the Gang of Four book. So the Goff patterns. Above design, there's architecture. Architecture is about the big things, the connection between bigger things like modules, perhaps um, entire uh, larger components. And usually that is the stuff that is much, much harder to change. Much harder because it's the big decisions that everything else builds on. In this case, usually we talk about architectural patterns. So client-server architecture, microservices. You might have heard about the model uh, view controller and different ones. There's books that talk about these too, but they also sometimes talk about the small things. So it's kind of a novel app. So Martin Fowler's book and also this one, they actually give architectural, but also a couple of design patterns. Now below design is the implementation details. The details that we need to probably implement the design. So how do we implement one of these design patterns? How exactly? By means of features. And there is implement pa implementation patterns also. All the things that we see again and again that repeat, therefore are patterns, but that are just concerned about, well, implementation details. But there's one more thing, and perhaps this is also a little confusing. There's idioms. And idioms sometimes actually are in the realm of design and sometimes they're in the realm of implementation details. So for instance, you might have heard about the NVI, the non-virtual interface idiom, which actually is design because it has to deal with or to do with dependencies, yeah? um, uh, tearing things apart, detangling things. And it is based on the idea of the template method design pattern described in the SCOF book. You might have also heard about the pimple idiom which is the simplest of all cases, of possible cases of the bridge design pattern. Also something that manages dependencies or reduces dependencies. But there's many, many idioms that are actually in the realm of implementation details. Like for instance, the temporary swap idiom. This is pretty a clever thing for, for instance, a copy assignment operator, but it's not detangling anything. The Rai idiom. It's about automating destruction. It's not detangling. Enable if, something that you see again and again, which of course, however, is more about implementation details. Or, perhaps in my opinion, factory functions. Now, just as a side note, the Rai idiom. I now place this in the realm of implementation details. Perhaps you have a different idea, a different um, understanding for this is. And perhaps you're more along Wikipedia again, software design patterns, the page that lists a lot of these patterns. And if you go to the creational patterns, actually, what do we find? Resource acquisition is initialization, right? So it is described as a design pattern. As I said before, I feel this is strange. Perhaps it is true for other languages, but for C++, this has nothing to do with dependencies. It has nothing to do with abstraction. It is automation. I would not list it here as a design pattern. I would list this as an implementation pattern. But also there's more. Singleton or also multiton. <laughs> multiton, yeah. Um, I don't feel this is design patterns. And especially with singleton, you actually might agree because you realize this is not Detangling, it is entangling. It creates dependencies. Just to give one more example, there's also one more Goff pattern that I feel is just an implementation detail, not really about design. That is Memento, which is one. So there's only two of 23 design patterns in the Goff book that do not use inheritance, and that is one of them. In other words, there's a lot to discuss. There's a lot to think about. Apparently, there is a lot of different ideas, different impressions. Which however raises the question, then what exactly is a design pattern? Well, I not should pick the one from the Gang of Four book, which of course has to do with factory, the factory method design pattern. 
Now, from my point of view, this is indeed a design pattern. So I assume that you're not all totally familiar with the idea. So very quick, there is some creator. It creates some kind of products. Both of these are base classes and can be implemented in form of concrete products and concrete creators. Now, why is this a design pattern and other things are not? Because in this particular case, I can actually separate concerns in terms of an architectural dependency. I can assign some things to some high level, something that is not changing, something that is considered to be stable. And I can also assign the implementation details to something that I consider to be the low level. It's volatile, malleable. Things are changing much more often. I cannot rely on these details so much. And so, of course, in a high level, I don't want to deal with all these details. I want an abstraction of that. And I get this in this particular case, which is kind of classic GOF uh, by means of a base class. It really deals with dependencies. It deals with abstraction. And there's even an inversion of dependencies simply because I actually um, have a clear structure from low to high level, high, uh, dependency from low level to high level. That is an architecture. That is what I expect to see in design. Everything else is not really design. So to make it clear, the purpose of a design pattern is to introduce a fitting abstraction for a well-known problem. And along with this abstraction comes a name. The name of a design pattern conveys the intent of the abstraction. And so a design pattern, actually, the name of the design pattern is really important. This is what enables you to talk about your intent. I am using a factory method here, actually, because I want to... Okay, now people actually should already know what you're trying to do. Sure, you want to abstract from creation and from, from products. That is conveyed by the name alone. And so it's make unique. It's not really something that provides an abstraction. So I rate this as an implementation pattern not a design pattern. It repeats again and again, but it's only in the level of implementation details. So to summarize, yeah, make unique is in the terminology that you're using a factory function, but it's unfortunate that this term is so heavily overloaded, can mean so many things. So just to be clear, make unique is a factory function, yes, but it is not a design pattern factory method design pattern. That is a design pattern, but that comes with a lot of abstraction. Okay, but I believe it's enough. No more hitting on make unique. I think you've taken the point. Let's take a, uh, take a look at a couple of other misconceptions. Misconceptions that I heard a couple of times in the last month, like design patterns are limited to runtime polymorphism. And then obviously also design patterns are limited to object-oriented programming. Design patterns are language-specific idioms, in particular something that I hear a lot about the GOF patterns, and design patterns can be recognized by their structure. I would like to talk about all of these, but not by giving multiple examples, but perhaps one example is actually sufficient. Perhaps, let's say two, I pick now two design patterns and take a look at these. And the first design pattern, again, a gang of four design pattern, because they're usually more well-known, is the command design pattern. Yes. All right, I have now picked the classic command design pattern, which on the right-hand side creates some kind of abstraction. So you get some base class called command, and I can, of course, now implement this in various ways. At some point, you have an invoker that just knows about this abstraction. And this invoker may eventually execute the command and a concrete command now creates some kind of feedback. Something happens, some action. Okay, now the mouse pointer is back in the middle. Okay, this seems to be the, the Logitech um, thing. I apologize. So it seems to be part of, the, um, of this clicker here. Now that design pattern comes with inheritance. And of course, if you see that, all of these are about um, 
a dynamic polymorphism and object-oriented programming. Yeah, so this is uh, kind of to be assumed, but I can actually show you also examples from the standard library. We can actually use the command design pattern for static polymorphism. If we provide some operation as a template parameter and then pass it to some function. Where do you find this in the standard library? Yes, in the algorithms. For instance, for each, you pass, of course, a range of, say, numbers, but then you also pass an action. Please do that to all the elements. I would argue this is the command design pattern again. It's the same intent. I want to do the, the same thing. So it appears in templates. It's not object-oriented, it's generic, or perhaps even functional programming. So apparently this actually is available in different forms too. I have a second example, the so-called strategy design pattern, which is also quite easy to, to summarize. You have some context on the left-hand side with some functionality that of course now carries implementation details. Now these details may actually cause coupling, sometimes heavy coupling. And for that reason, you would like to extract all of the logic here somewhere else to loosen the coupling and also to, of course, provide flexibility, if possible, even runtime flexibility. Now, what I introduce now on the right-hand side is a strategy. That strategy can be implemented in various forms. The King of Fortress calls them concrete strategy A and B. And now this context just gets a pointer to a strategy. By that, I've already extracted the implementation details. Also, this design pattern comes obviously with inheritance. Also, this design pattern actually has to do with runtime polymorphism. But also here, I can actually show you examples from the standard library. We could, for instance, provide a template parameter, pass it, and again, use this in form of an algorithm, like accumulate. Stood accumulate, say it gets a num couple of numbers, I start with zero, and then I provide some action that needs to be done. Wait a second. Didn't I just say this is the command design pattern? Okay, so that definitely is perhaps worth to talk about briefly because it depends, as all the answers in um, software design apparently start. If you take a look at these two, structurally, they are virtually identical. I don't see a difference between these two, except for the names, but structurally, no difference. And also, if I see these algorithms for each or accumulate, and then take a look at this template argument that is the action, there's no difference. So what exactly then is command and what exactly is strategy? Really interesting question, which unfortunately is not easily answered by the Gang of Four book itself. Because all it has to say about command is encapsulate request as an object, thereby letting you parameterize clients with different requests, cure or log operations and support undo operations. That's the short form. Of course, there's an entire chapter about this. And the strategy design pattern, define a family of algorithms, encapsulate each one, and make them interchangeable. The strategy lets the algorithm vary independently from clients that use it. Now, from that description, you would tend to say, well, then everything is strategy because it mentions algorithms. It's not that easy, I believe. There's actually a nice thing um, that you can do. You can, of course, use your favorite search engine and type in command versus strategy pattern. You actually find quite a number of pretty interesting explanations. And I'm going to pick one that I believe actually hits the nail. This is what I believe is, uh, is pretty accurate. Typically, the command pattern is used to make an object out of what needs to be done. The strategy pattern, on the other hand, is used to specify how something should be done. Now, I totally agree, this is kind of a very subtle difference, 
But actually, this is what these what the difference between the two is. It's not the structure, it's the intent. So specify what should be done, and you have a command pattern. Specify how something should be done, and you actually have a strategy. And the same thing, the same intent also applies to these algorithms. What should I do with each element in forage? Well, this is a command. And how should I accumulate the elements in accumulate? Well, I believe this is a strategy. So the takeaway is the intent of the command design pattern is to specify what should be done. And the intent of the strategy design pattern is to specify how something should be done. But most importantly, remember that the difference between design patterns is not the structure. It's the intent. It's what you want to do. It's what you want to convey as a message. I'm trying to achieve that goal. The intent. All of these 23 golf design patterns have some intent. And that is the one thing that you really need to remember. And so, also, hopefully in these examples you realized, design patterns are neither limited to object-oriented programming nor dynamic polymorphism. They can be used for functional, generic, programming just as well, and static polymorphism, of course, too. They're universally applicable because the intent is always present. You always want to solve a particular problem. And now, just as a last, perhaps, idea, consider to include the name of design pattern into the class name to help convey the intent. That actually would have been a nice move, but of course, the STL and the Gov um, book appeared kind of in the same year. So in 1994, the book appeared, and in 1994, the STL was voted into the uh, standard library. But it would have been nice if instead of naming for for each this unir function and for accumulate, instead of naming it binary operation, we could have perhaps named this unary command and binary strategy. Perhaps this would have clarified a couple of things. I don't know. It's a guess. Definitely, it would have made a direct relation to some kind of design pattern. So I don't think that design patterns are limited to either paradigm, to any uh, sort of dynamic or static polymorphism. I believe they're pretty universally applicable. However, there's a couple of more further misconceptions about design patterns. Something that also I find a little troubling sometimes, and that is that design patterns are outdated, nobody needs them anymore, and the design patterns have become completely obsolete. We don't need to design anymore. Sometimes this truly is a little troubling. And so now I try to prove that it's exactly the opposite. They are just as important as they ever have been. And I'm trying to actually do this in form of a live coding session. Yeah, live coding. Now, this is, of course, the part where everything will fail, where everything will not work anymore. And definitely for me, it's the hardest part. But perhaps it's a little fun too. However, let's agree on one thing. It's not about the implementation details. I will skip so many details. I will focus entirely on design decisions. And that actually may be the thing to take away from this little thing. And now our task is to actually provide an abstraction for callables in the following example. So I have some function f that takes some callable. I call this fn, short for function, of course. And I would like to actually abstract from this because the implementation details should no longer be in the header file. I want to have a runtime abstraction. All right, so that is the task. And now, of course, some of you have a very simple answer. That doesn't count yet. Let's do something on the, about this on our own. Not because we want, uh, but because we need, but because we want to. The first idea is to provide an abstraction. Quite simple. So let's introduce a func base. This is not a beautiful name, but it definitely is a base class. Virtual func base, func base equal default. Now, for everything that I get, you know, like 
this lambda here in the application would actually derive from that lit thing, oh, it would be so easy. But of course, lambda will not inherit from that base class, which means I just create the right class on my own. I call this class, yes, and use a struct, no difference, func impl. I know, again, clever name, but this func impl definitely is a func base. That little fella is supposed to store whatever I pass. Well, it could be a lambda, it could be a function object, or perhaps just a function pointer, but it stores some function thing. But in order to make this work, that little fella here needs to be a template. I have now created an abstraction, believe it or not. And actually, I have used the design pattern here. I've created a design pattern based on, or I've used the design pattern, and this is called external polymorphism. Design pattern. And yes, this is not one of the Gang of Four. This is actually something that was released in, or published in 1996. It's a little younger, two years younger, um, but it's a little different. If you now believe this is an adapter, very close indeed, but the adapter design pattern has to do with an existing hierarchy. I'm now introducing a new one. So it's that design pattern. Now, of course, I do have an abstraction. I could now finally say that this is a, a func base, point of reference, I don't care at this point. I could actually move all of this into the source file, detangling dependencies. I no longer depend on, on a lot of things. I kind of hide implementation details. Cool. Of course, you now have to adapt a couple of things like, how do I call it? Well, sure. Um, you cannot really use it, call it at this point. But for that reason, we now introduce a virtual function that I call invoke. Why not? At this point, I am do a little hand-waving, distract you from the fact that we I now introduce a couple of types that are not known. We'll get them soon enough. So this invoke returns an R, some return type, and also gets a bunch of arguments, little arcs. Function can be const, why not? At least one important implementation detail, and to be a virtual function. That fella now, of course, needs to be implemented in the driving class, which I think is important. I make final and I implement this as return fn of arcs. Yeah, I know. I can move forward, etc. I don't care about these details. Now I'm actually able to probably invoke the thing down here. Invoke. Cool. Very nice. Now, the only thing is, of course, that I have to adapt my main function where I pass the lambda, because the lambda is not inheriting from that thing. Of course, that doesn't work anymore. So, it's the easy thing, say make unique. So we try to create some kind of pointer that holds that, of course, um, and that is given the lambda. And I get, of course, some std unique unique pointer of func base, something like that. Could call it fn, whatever. Um, okay. And I could dereference fn at this point. Not so important. More important is that point here. Which type do I actually have to pass here? So func impl, okay, true. But of what? That is tough and very unnice. I would like to automate this. I would like to deduce the type. For that, I could use a function, true. But I could perhaps wrap this entire stuff anyway, because I actually do not really like the idea to carry a point around. So let's do the following. We just wrap this properly. Struct callable. Okay, now this I make a class. There's some public stuff. 
come on, public, and some private stuff. I feel like this structs here, this is this look like private stuff. So I keep it here in a private section. And also, I probably now can use a unique pointer right here. A unique pointer to a func base. So the thing that I tried in the main function is now properly encapsulated at this point. And I give it a name. Some of you might already have an idea. You're correct. I call this a pimple. Yes, I've just used another design pattern. This is, first of all, the pimple idiom. Yes, of course. But that is the simplest form of the bridge design pattern. Trying to hide some implementation details. And most fascinatingly, now the implementation details are generated by the compiler. OK, I have a pimple, which I now need, of course, to initialize in my constructor, in some constructor. Callable. That one takes a, say, um, well, anything. So I call this fn, this function, get this constructor a template. But this takes anything. It even takes lambdas. It deduces the type. And that function now knows full well what I need. My pimple, meaning my unique pointer, let me scroll down here. So my pimple is now initialized by make unique of func impl fn. And I simply pass my fn here. I've now created something that takes some fn, something initializes the according class in that constructor, and still I have an abstraction, a runtime abstraction, to be sure. Pretty cool, pretty nice. The next thing, however, in order to make it useful for my main function is that, of course, I need to be able to call it. Right now, there is, there's nothing that I can do with it. I can just create it. But obviously, the next step is function call operator. That one now returns, again, my R, again, a little hand waving, and also takes a couple of arguments, some things. Well, how do we implement this function call operator? Well, I have everything in place already. I can simply return whatever pimple invoke returns. And of course, I'm, yes, I know, forward a couple of arguments. Cool, because now I already have the right opportunity to introduce all of these unknown types. Template, type name R, type name dot dot dot, arcs. We are actually homing in on something really interesting. This thing is now something that I can already use. So like here, in this, at this point, I would have a callable of, say, so this is sprinting some number. So I return void and I take an int. And of course, the same thing appears here. Callable void, void comma int. And then here at this point, I can actually, oh, I should not get rid of my lambda. I can actually make this work in this way, callable. And I pass my callable. Not bad. In just a few lines of code, picking a couple of design patterns, I've created runtime abstraction that actually turns out to be quite, quite nice and useful. Now, of course, there's a couple of critics out there that basically point out, no, it's not complete yet. And I totally agree. It's nice, it's short, but if I use, use it in the way uh, down, uh, as I indicated down there, actually would need to copy it. And right now, that thing is not really copyable. So perhaps it's time to actually think about the special member functions. I believe since you're experts, this is this is something that you know dead call. So of course the first thing we think about is the destructor, which is 
default. I have a unit pointer. That one, that thing will take care of all the rest. I don't need to delete anything on my own. Great. The next thing that's kind of simple, as you know, is move. Callable. Let's give it a name. Uh, we don't even need to because we can default it. Unique pointer is doing all the work for me. I can move forward. Um, I can move construct it perfectly. And last but not least, the move assignment operator is actually also working perfectly. Indeed, the only two functions that give me a little trouble and a little headache is the copy operations. So in other words, the copy constructor and of course the copy assignment operator. These two are a little mean because a unique pointer cannot be copied. And indeed, if I now want to copy construct a callable, what should I copy? All I have is a pointer to base. Well, I think it's time again for a design pattern. And yes, if you want to create a copy from some abstract thing, like a base, there is just the right design pattern to do that. And that is correct. Prototype design pattern. Again, one of these gang of four design patterns that allows you to copy anything. So this thing in the C11 uh, way returns a unique pointer to a funk base. Of course, is now implemented in the deriving class. Sure, it has to. It's a pure virtual function. So I make this final just because it's the right thing to do, especially in this context. And I implement this clone function that now knows exactly what needs to be copied as return std make unique of func impl and as myself, use a copy constructor. Cool. By means of this design pattern, I'm now actually able to copy very, very easily. My pimple is initialized by other dot pimple. So I use the pimple of the other thing. Oops. And I call clone. Please give me a copy. It will work. And since we're here, we now also very, very easily implement the copy assignment operator. Well, no, not by a design pattern, but by means of an idiom, a temporary swap idiom. Now, what do we do? We create a temporary callable. Let's call it temp. It's temporary by means of this other thing. It will call a copy constructor which does all the cloning, etc. And once we've done that, actually we are in a very nice position to simply swap the pimples, the unique pointers. We can return. I believe that's it. Now, sure, I might have formatted it a little unfortunately, but this is like 40, 45 lines of code but I've created a very, very convenient abstraction. Now, we're not quite done yet. I totally agree. First of all, because probably most of you know what I've just done. Yeah, sure. If I now rename that, suddenly it may make a little more sense. Let's call this function. Oh, yes. In just 45 lines, we've implemented a very, very simple form of function. This fn and this fn2. In just 45 lines, I've implemented a very, very rudimentary form of a std function. There's just perhaps one tiny detail that is not really working out well, 
but this is again an implementation detail still i like to fix it um because standard function takes a single argument kind of looks like that template type name fn class function that is the signature of that function it doesn't take many arguments the thing is i'm very very close in actually making this work just use this as a specialization and voila actually done the job now i totally agree that this may have been a little fast a little fast indeed but the major takeaway is the following i've implemented in let's say 50 lines of code a simple form of standard function but not by just moving along and plowing away using my own details but by just using um, design patterns three of them and one idiom so four things that are commonly known that by using the right names and a couple of comments are actually known to other people as well and yes what i've just implemented is type erasure i've implemented the same thing that you might have seen in the talk probably the most famous talk about this inheritance is the base class of evil and probably this is what jean Perry might have felt if he implemented that he did new life but he was also plowing through the implementation really really quick so this is the talk that usually people attribute to inventing type erasure not quite not quite if you do some research actually there is something else there is a paper from 2000 called valued conversions written by kevlin henny and to my best knowledge this is the very first time that this technique was actually used and he implements stood any not the stood any but a very simple form but still stood any and he bases his implementation on the aforementioned external polymorphism paper so Cleland, Schmidt, and Harrison um, have come up with this idea. And again, the paper starts with intent. A design pattern is about an intent, creating something. I'm going to show how this intent can be implemented in old C++. So, type erasure. One side remark that I just do because, um, indeed, um, I have heard also a lot here. There's a very nice website that I can recommend um, more C++ idioms. And of course, they also talk about type erasure. Unfortunately, they talk about it as variant, boost any, stood any. Seriously unfortunate. Seriously unfortunate. Even in, in other cases, I actually had to counter argue that this is very, very bad. Stood variant is fundamentally different from a design perspective. If you use a variant, you want to extend operations, not types. If you use type erasure on the other hand, you want to add types, not operations. And so if you truly want names to convey meaning and message, we actually should be sure what we are talking about. So perhaps just as a side remark, but please consider to use type erasure if you actually mean the type erasure that I've just implemented. That allows me to add different types, lambdas, function objects, whatever. I can, can only call it though. I cannot add operations. That is a job of a variant. Very, very, very different in terms of design indeed. So the major takeaways though, well, use type erasure if your intent is to abstract from many possible types, assuming a fixed set of operations. Then, definitely, design patterns are not outdated. They're not obsolete either. We use them. Even in our most recent designs, like type erasure, they're everywhere. So, design patterns are everywhere. Learn to recognize them and use according names to communicate your intent. And this is now the point where I truly say, well, I shamelessly um, highlight a couple of upcoming training classes. I know this is pretty bad, but still, this is kind of what I live from. The first thing that I can recommend, if you want to learn more about design patterns, if you want to recognize them, 
in many ways, uh, in, in many situations. And also, if you want to learn how to use them, then there's a one-day workshop next Monday um, at the ADC++. Modern C++ design patterns. It's probably in German, but um, you still can learn a lot about different design patterns. And it's one day only, though. Something similar is happening at um, CPP on C. I will again give a short course or workshop on modern C++ design patterns. Also here, you will learn about design patterns in general, how to use them, how to recognize them, but also what they mean. Also, what is type ratio in comparison to variant? That will be a major topic. And Jens already mentioned that, the three-day version. If you really want to learn a lot, and if you also want to discuss things like singletons, factories, decorators of service and the like, then this is the place to be, the workshop to be in. So a three-day workshop on modern C++ design patterns at um, beginning of June. Three days, that's a lot, but definitely um, you will take away a lot of information. Okay, that's the end of the advertisement. My summary, design patterns are about dependencies and abstractions. That is what they are. That is the major point. You want to detangle your software entities. They're about intent. You have something to do. The name now um, makes this possible. You communicate your intent. They're definitely not limited to object-oriented programming. I know the golf book is strict about object-oriented programming, but all these intents can be transformed into solutions that work for other things as well. And also so that along with it, it's not limited to dynamic polymorphism. Static polymorphism just works as well. I do not think that they're outdated or obsolete. I believe they're everywhere, even today in our most recent designs. Okay, with it, I'm, I'm done. Thank you very much for your attention. Hopefully this was something that um, makes you now consider to think about it and perhaps also to contribute your own ideas, your own opinions about design patterns, soft design in general, and perhaps a couple of solutions about the hard problems. Things like Singleton. Okay, thank you very much.